Welcome to It's a Trans World Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Raquel, and uh, my co-host, I'm going to let him introduce yourself, and we're going to get going with our special guest, uh, Raquel Henry, is on with us tonight. Malik? Hey, this is Malik Santiago. Welcome, Raquel. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to tonight. Yeah. So we uh, we got a host of questions uh, for you, Raquel. But before we do that, uh, Malik is going to go through some current events, and we're going to give some local shout outs to individuals that's doing great things in the trans community. So Malik, what you got over there? So um, we want to dive into this uh, SB 140. Um, as you know, that's a big subject that we're dealing with, especially here in Atlanta, Georgia, where the governor recently signed a bill that pre prohibits transgender youth from affirming surgeries. What do you feel about that, Raquel? Well, um, first off, I think that that the governor shouldn't even get the opportunity or have the faith though over what a parent's child allows for their child. I remember that there was the day where whatever your parents said about you being their child was good enough. It worked, right? And so now we are in this world, we've come to this space and place where the government feels like they get to dictate to parents how to parent their children. And so I think it's absolutely wrong. I think it's ludicrous. I think that they are out of, out of line for feeling like they have that authority to do that. I do not like it at all. I, I'll ask you this, Kel. Um, do you think from a parent's perspective, I'm a parent and um, I have two children. Do you think that a child should at least be a certain age before the parent says, okay, yeah, let's make make the changes? Do you think the child should be a certain age before that happens? No, I think the child should be a certain age personally, yes. Um, but then on the flip side of that, you have some children who at three, they can tell their mommy, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a boy. I'm a girl, mommy. And they were born a boy. Right. And so, um, they begin to have mental issues at three because the mommy keeps saying that they're a boy because that's what she had if the doctor told her that's what the genitalia looks like but that child keeps saying mommy i'm a girl just like you um uh, i don't want to be a boy like daddy um and so i feel like um, a good parent for me right uh, maybe they don't allow their child to begin to transition at three but they uh meet their child somewhere like right? Maybe let their child wear a panty possibly, or maybe let their child go with them to the nail salon and get their nails done and get their feet up. Just kind of meet them somewhere and kind of coach that child that baby, as you get older, you know, and, and this is still what you want. Mommy's going to help you be the little girl you see. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that before there are any medical procedures done, a child should be a certain age, number one. I mm -hmm. think as a parent, it's um, our job to nurture right nurture what the child feels um and and what you see because i think we see it too it's not even you know just what the baby says right we can see it we know if we are looking at a little boy or a little girl um and and the one thing about children is they they don't necessarily identify with gender at that age you know they're they're just children so i i you know it's always touchy to have the conversation and while I think there should be an age limit in place, I do think the child and the parent need to be able to ultimately make the decision and not government. That's right. And with that, um, me personally, I look at it almost like um, the abortion uh, bill. Like, who are you, you know, to try to govern what a woman does with their body? You know, so I view it like that, but um, thankfully, there are many organizations out there that are doing the work to combat these bills or to try to combat these bills. One such organization, um, TWOC Healing Project, um, uh, the I Am Human Foundation, um, Sean Coleman, let me give a shout out to Sean Col Coleman, him 
and Alex Santiago. They are out there doing the work for Destination Tomorrow, um, fighting bills, meeting with uh, government, meeting with mayors, and getting things done. So I like to shout those organizations out and those people. Another person, Sebastian Smith. He's a he's the people's voice um, for combating bills. Um, so I just wanted to give those shout outs because we need these people. We need advocacy out here for these different bills for combating government, trying to run our households. Good. Right. I couldn't agree more. Um, and every 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 show that we have, guys, we will highlight something that's going on in the trans community um, and giving flowers wow people can still receive them uh, there's no place i'd rather be than right here telling these stories real stories by real people raquel we are going to kind of switch gears a little bit and ask you some personal questions because the one thing that we've learned in the process of filming trans world atlanta which is our new tv series is people are so uneducated about gender about um, identity as far as sexuality. So we want to try to educate those who are willing to learn, especially uh, for those parents that are struggling with it, right? Or those siblings or those friends are struggling with why is my brother, why is my sister now trans or non-binary for that matter. Um, But before we get started, know that we lead with love on this show and this is a safe place we have lots of conversations or we will have lots of conversations around love, mental and physical health, health and being able to support each other in our communities. Um, These topics are not just topics that we wanna know, but topics that we've been able to gather from individuals. So today with Raquel, we wanna talk about your transition, right? Your personal experiences with family, with friends and, and, what was your journey as you transitioned? What was my journey as I transitioned? Well, um, I actually did not have a rough journey, right? Um, I had some one family member, which was my aunt, who um, kind of gave me the blues. Um, she told me that God did not, uh, that, what did she say? That I am aborting my anointing. So I was raised in church growing up, right? Yeah. Raised in the holiest church at that. <laughs> Go figure where they teach you that homosexuality is an abomination. Of course, at the age of 47 today, I'm 47. At the age of 47, I know that that was what Leviticus said. And God never said anything about um, homosexuality, right? And so growing up, I always felt like, Right. I used to think that maybe because my grandmother had four daughters, there were no men in the family. So maybe I used to think that it's because I was around that, but girls, but then I had older guy cousins and on my dad's dad side of the family, there was a whole lot of men. And so that wasn't what it was. Um, at the age of 15, I had a mental breakdown and found out that I was born with a hormonal imbalance. And so I grew breasts like young girls do. So hold, t- hold tight, Raquel. I want you to keep that thought, but okay. I want us to be very clear that Raquel was born male. Raquel is a trans woman. So right. I don't know if we really identified that. And we should <laughs> have, have, especially for those of you that are watching and not just listening to the show, but you're actually watching. It's a trans world podcast. Raquel was born male and she is trans. So... I just want to give you some clarity if you're a little confused, if you're watching. Okay, Kel, go back into it. Oh, yes, I am friends. I was born my mother's son, but I am my mother's daughter. Um, so, um, like I said, I was born with a whole little imbalance, and we found that out um, at the age of 15 when I had my first mental breakdown. And my mental breakdown was surrounded with me dealing with my sexuality. Um and um, so that's where my breast came from. I, I never had breast augmentation or anything like that. And so for me, I remember um, saying to my grandmother, I'm talking about my mom's mom, uh, we were st- standing at the sink and we were cleaning chicken. Ta-da! And um, my grandmother said, you know that we love you and you know that you're the life of our family and all that kind of stuff. She said, but do you have to be a girl? And so... 
I said, well, grandma, can I ask you a question with your question? Normally, you know, you're taught not to ask the question with the question you're supposed to answer it. But I knew that me asking her a question would probably change our conversation. And so I said to my grandmother, you know, when I was growing up, you know, you would put all of my cousins and siblings out when you were getting drunk or said, if you wouldn't put me out and I would ask you questions about your foundation. And so those who don't know what I mean by foundation, I'm talking about her girl or her bra or undergarment. I said, and you would answer them. I said, and why didn't you put me out? My grandmother's response without thinking was, well, it felt like you were supposed to be there. Well, we went back to cleaning chicken, needless to say. <laughs> and we never had another conversation about it. Um, my dad's mom, on the other hand, um, uh, she we were watching, I don't know if any of you remember, but uh, Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Absolutely. Absolutely. You wear the red glasses. That's a dairy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Sally, Je- Sally, Jesse, Raphael was talking about, she had little boys on her show who felt like that they were girls. And um, my grandmother said to me, if you ever pull that shit, I mean, excuse me, can I cut from here? You, hey, we're wide open. Go ahead. Um, and I got to say it like that because my grandmother used profanity. That was how she talked, right? Mm-hmm. And so my, and this is my dad's mother I'm talking about. My grandma, Orly Jones, God rest her soul. My grandmother would say, you ever pull that fucking shit? I don't want to disown your ass, you know, right? And so not only was grandma was kind of jolt you but this time I wasn't jolted I was almost intrigued with what she said and I'm sure it had to be maybe at least a month later that I went to grandma's house and I said grandma I'm gay and my grandmother's response wasn't what she said it was going to be my grandmother then said to me you make sure you respect yourselves and make sure others respect you and as long as you do that you'll be fine because you're my grandchild and the fucker out there don't miss it. <laughs> so I want to go back to something you said. Um, you said that your m- mental breakdown was um, it attributed to you dealing with your uh, sexuality, right? Mm-hmm. And you also said that uh, um, you have uh, you grew breasts, right? Mm-hmm. So did that make you happy did that like did that help any i only think it was confusing but that's a great question so i'll answer the latter part of the question and then answer the first part so the latter part of the question well no it didn't make me happy or sad because myself as well as my family we thought it was fat okay Okay. and from thinking it was fat we thought that maybe i had kind of come because i was thick but i wasn't a fat you know, when I was younger. And so um, having them into break them, they run all kinds of tests for you, do all kinds of blood work, and they put all these leads all over your body and on your brain and everything. And so running all them tests, that's when we found out that this was actually breast tissue. And it wasn't gynecomastia, but it was breast tissue. And so um, in my at, when I begin to transition, oh, yes, I was happy. I had breath. I didn't have to pick wood. You got to pick your heart. Okay. But that's what on the wall, and that was it. <laughs> so, um, so yes, it made me happy then. Um, so, were you ever confused with that? No, because well, she knew. Again, I thought it was fat. So you thought it was fat. We didn't. It wasn't a thing like, oh my god, what's this up here? No. As I was growing up, they were growing, and so I thought nothing of it. And I, I didn't put them in no bra, so I didn't know how good they could actually look. So I didn't, you know, so no, I didn't, it wasn't about a, a um, confusing thing. It wasn't about something was wrong. Um, I became sexually active at an early age. And so boys would suck on them. Um, and I thought that was bad. But I didn't they would, think. What? They would suck, yeah, on, would suck them. on them. You, you heard me, sir. Um, <laughs> they would suck on them. And um, other than that was just fabulous. I, and even then, it wasn't the thought of like, oh my God, I got breasts. You know, I got titties. And people say, I don't like to call on breast titties because I believe pigs had titties. Anywho. Um, so I didn't, that wasn't something that I relished in. I've never been the kind of person that relished in my privilege, right? Privilege. Why do you say privilege? It's called trans privilege. Like, so I didn't even know that there was a such thing 
that I was navigating life with, you know, so I was navigating with trans privilege because of the way that I look. We'll grow facial hair. I will have masculine features and, you know, I'm, I don't talk deep and um, aggressive or authoritative yet, but talk deep and, and you know, so I, I didn't experience any of those things. So I was navigating through life um, with no issue. I was navigating through life being the girl that I am. And even before I transitioned, um, those who I went to school with, right, used to say to me, what is taking you so long? So when I transitioned in my little town, uh, in Lenox City, New Jersey, it's not six miles wide or, or deep, um, wide or long, um, people were just like, it took me long enough. And so being a hairstylist, it was kind of easy for me to transition because I was a hairstylist. So I just got let my hair grow. Um, and then when I found out I didn't have to let my hair grow, that I already fishy or cut looking when they cut my hair all off and you know still you know was able to get through so yeah it, it wasn't it wasn't a bad transition for me it, it just it just wasn't if I could say that anything that that I don't even know to say that it really bothered me right but if I were to say that I had an episode that um kind of upset me was we had a family cookout one time this was the first time that I decided to wear a shirt in front of my family. And my aunt was going around my grandmother's house saying, you see your cousin in the skirt? Say it to all my cousins. You see your cousin in the skirt? You see your cousin in the skirt? And my grandmother, I'll never forget it. My grandmother called her by her name. Um, and uh, my grandmother said, well, my, my, my grandmother called her by her name. My aunt said she looked pristine. And she said, um, what mom, y'all allow him? She said, uh-uh. Leave my grandbaby alone. My aunt said, Well, mom, you did it. She said, Leave my grandbaby alone. And that was kind of the end of it as far as me going through with my family. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go back a little bit because I think it's important for us to talk about mental health. Um okay. we know that mental health is has been a huge challenge, not just in our communities in the LGBTQIA community, but also just across the country. Talk about your mental breakdown at 15 and what that looked like. So my mental breakdown at 15 looked like, oh, my mom will probably kill me at some point, but she'd have to be strong because it's my truth. Um, my mom's boyfriend uh, and I, um, this guy our mother was going with, um, we would be, you know, like together talking as a family. What I mean by like, me, me my mom, him, and my siblings. And he would always say to me, I'm going to get you, right? And I used to say to tell my mom, Mommy, he mean, get me, get me. She would be saying, oh, child, be quiet. You don't know what I'm But I mean, inside myself, what he meant by that. And so that actually happened. Um, he got me. And what I mean by he got me sexually. Um, uh, I felt like I was grown, but the reality is I really wasn't grown. And so according to law, he sexually assaulted me. Um, I was fast, so I wanted it. Um if I'd be lying to say I didn't, but he, that adult had 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 no 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 right to do that to me, um, being a teenager. And um this Negro proposed to my mother. Wow. And when he proposed to my mother, I'm talking about put a diamond on her finger, proposed to her, and that was when I told her. And when I told my mother, um, a older friend of mine, I rest his soul, Daryl Hall, I'll never forget it. I told Daryl Hall about it before I told my mom. And Daryl Hall told me, don't tell your mother because she'll choose her man. Wow. And that was probably for me the first time that I got hurt by my mom. How long did this go on between your mom's boyfriend and you? Uh, it happened for about a good nine months wow yeah so about a good nine months um and i told my mother because he had proposed for um and mama we should believe and how old did you say you were at the time 15. 15. and my friend daryl told me uh because i always had older older friends my my friend were older i was I, i've always been um beyond my years. My grandmother's always called me old soul. And so children my age weren't, um, weren't, uh, they, they did move. I, what's, the, what's the word I'm looking for? 
they weren't appealing to me, for lack of a better word. Um, they weren't interest, interesting to me. So I always hung around older people. And Daryl was um, an older uh, gay guy, homosexual man. And he told me, don't tell her. I was like, that's my mother. My mother loves me. And she wouldn't. And he didn't lie. My mother picked me. So for nine months, you're having sex with your mother's boyfriend and your mm-hmm. mom. And I love the word. So again, I'm telling my story. So I, I don't know. In telling my story, I'm not going to tell her story. But my mother had some things to do every weekend. Let me say that. Okay. Or my mother was at home. Okay. Oh, they used to do and she had them to do actually she had them to do over a year span. Okay. I love her. And so in her having those things to do, that's why my mother wasn't there. Um, and of course I was 15 and um, you know, I was old enough to help with the children with my siblings who were younger than myself. Um, and so that's what I did. And so again, like I said, I've always I, I've always felt older than I actually was. So, you know, I'm so grown. You know, um, you know, I knew that's what he wanted. And deep down inside, I wanted to. And not even I wanted it because it was my mother's boyfriend. My therapist said to me, were you jealous of your mother? And I wasn't. Like, I I wasn't. He said he was going to get me. And and I thought he was fired and okay, get me. Um, but I did try to shield myself or protect myself because I told my mother. Let me ask you this. So at 15... For the most part, we know right from wrong. Mm-hmm. Did it not feel heavy to know that you were with your mother's boyfriend, someone she loved, someone she cared about? Like, I don't know what it's like for a 15 year old to, I don't know what that process is like, but as as a child, because a 15 year old is a child, are you even thinking about your mom? I was, yeah. And you know what I thought about my mother after, every time after we had sex? I thought about her every time after we had sex. Oh, I thought it was sad, you know, while it was happening. But every time after we had sex, then that's when I thought about on my own. Um, um, and so when he proposed to her, me thinking about her all that time, when he proposed to her, I was like, okay, that's it. Like, you're not going to marry her. Are you doing this to me? Uh, and, um, when I finally told her, my mother didn't believe me. He said he would never, he ain't no faggot. That was his exact words, he ain't no faggot. And um, I told, then told my pastor, who was my aunt's husband. My pastor then told my mother's pastor, who was supposed to marry them. And um, I remember one day, uh, my mom wasn't home, and I went in my mother's room and I said to him, why would you lie? You know what, what we've been doing. And in my faith, he, you know, told me, I ain't never done no shit like that. I ain't no faggot or whatever. And all of us remember back in the day, it used to be these real thick um, pieces of glass that said mom or they said dad. And like, you could put a picture in it. It was a yeah. real thick piece of glass. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And so my mother had one that said mom. You know, so, so I um, jumped on him and commenced to, to beating him up and took that to go hit him. And when I hit him, um, my baby sister at that time, Amika came in, she was uh, three years old, three or four. And she said to me, um, stop, what are you doing? What are you doing? And that's what jolted me to get off of him. And that night he was in the bed laying next to my mother. And I said, I wouldn't tap my mother. And I said, is he dead yet? And after that, the next day, I was helping a friend move. And while helping her move, I got in her bathtub and took off all of my clothes. And that was my first mental break. Now, you said first, first mental breakdown. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There were others? Three. I had four in total. How old were you in these different, doing these different Fifteen. times? Fifteen. 17, 18, and 19. I did all of them. Um, did they come about because of what you had dealt with or your sexuality? Or So they all stemmed from my sexuality. But after that first one, that was a done deal with him. You know what I'm saying? 
And so I, again, I, like I said to you earlier, I was raised in the holiness church. So we would have what you call uh, revivals. And a lot of times the revivals turned into deliverance services. Mm. And so of course, you know, I would go to the altar to get prayer to be delivered from homosexuality. And um, we'd have a good revival and, you know, I'd be at the altar, get prayed for and bam, I'm delivered again. Um, unbeknownst to me, it was my emotion. It had nothing to do with being delivered. It was my emotions. And so they put the mic in my hand, tell the church what the Lord did for you. And I would say that God delivered me as the church would get excited. They would just, you know, get on, get excited, run around the church so and so on. And at that time, um, you know, I was a hair stylist. And so I started buying female clothing. Um, so by the time I was 19, um, and I got delivered again for the last time, um, I would give away my clothes to the women at the church. Um, and so each time that I had a mental breakdown, I was mentally institutionalized. Um, I was on medicine from the age of 15 to I was 27. Um, lithium, for anybody out there who knows what medicine is, um, I was on lithium, how dark, and Jensen, and not Prax. Of course, we all know what medicine is, but the kind of medicine. Right, right, right. I was on lithium, how dark, and Jensen, and Vipraxa. And the medicine would have me so lethargic sometimes. Right. I would know what day I could be sitting and I could be drooling from the mouth and wouldn't know it. Mm. Mm. So what does support look like um, when you were going through those breakdowns? What does support look like from your family? So before it looked like my mother had to get in counseling. And she did, because at the end of the day, um, despite her loving her man, I was her child. And and now something happened to her child. Um, so at the age of 15, my mother got in counseling with me. Um, counseling that looked like uh, family sessions and then she, she had to go herself. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, support looked like my grandmother. Um, Looked like both of my grandmothers. Um, support looked like my family rallied around me, like because they really, my family really loved me. Um, and so here it was. I was going through something medically. Now it wasn't. It wasn't for them. It wasn't about the sexuality piece. You know, it was about that. You know, uh, for my aunts, my nephew, for my grandmother, my grandchild, uh, my grandson is on medication and. You know, we know this baby to be intelligent. We know this baby to be strong-willed, strong-minded. And so um, they they all run it so much so that my community, and when I mean my community, so the neighborhood I lived in, they all run it. I remember one time having a mental break, and I was in the middle of the parking lot, and Tayresha Moore, I'll never forget it, she always be my good girlfriend, Tayresha Moore came outside our door, and she was like, if you don't get the hell up off this ground, do you know what you're doing? She's like, I'm in these tight jeans. Get up. Why? What are you doing? Why are you letting this happen to you? Get up, get up, get up. Um, and so my community um, loved me. So out of support, I, I cannot say that I didn't have support because I did. I had support like my other. I sang. So I was very popular in my city. Um, so everybody knew me. Um, and so there were nights that I would be out three, four, five o'clock in the morning walking the street. And the police would get me, put me in the car and take me home because everybody knew me. I think one of the things things that we are not used to hearing or accustomed to hearing um, is how family, friends, community rally around you. Because what we see mostly is children become homeless. They're rejected by their family and friends. They're rejected by the church, especially the black church. Um, So we don't hear that often enough. And I don't know if it's because it's not happening often or we just don't get to hear those stories, but it is very rare just being where I am in life to hear someone say, you know what? My family rallied around me. My family loved me through. They, They walked this journey with me so often individuals of trans experience, um, lesbian, whatever, right? They're, they're walking it by themselves. And the only help they have is a friend that's probably not doing the right thing themselves or an influence that's trying to help them and telling them what they know. But the reality is they're not doing things the right way. So I think it's important that 
people know that all families aren't <laughs> their children, you know, their siblings, um, not all families, too many, of course, but not all. So I think that's um, something that people need to hear. Um, I know it's hard for parents, right? You know, you, you birth a son and then your son tells you, you know, you know, mommy, I'm a girl. That's hard for any parent. And I think a parent, it should be allowed grace and time to go through their process because they, they're human too, right? They're going through it with you. And the one thing about our experiences, me as a lesbian, you don't go through it by yourself. It affects other people as well. And at some point they have to respect you and meet you where you are, but they should be allowed grace. And for me, I gave my mother grace. Like I never, I always said to my mother, the world gets to cut me off. The world gets to let me go, but you don't get to, right? And so who am I to tell her she didn't get to let me go? Thank God that I had the kind of mother that for her, she already believed that she didn't get let, let she didn't get to let me go. She felt like that God thought enough of her to give me her. And she thought enough of God not to let me go just because of what I was going through. So my mother, I but I but I was determined never to try and manage my mother's process. I was clear that I was going through a process, and so I wasn't going to try to manage her process. The blessing is that my mother held on to me in the process. We went through a whole six years of processing. My mother went from calling me them to they to child of mine, and there were kids. <laughs> and I'm not talking about overnight. Like, I'm talking about over time she was calling me. When my mother would, would um, refer to me, it was, yeah. I'm one person, like, what the hell, like, but she referred to me as that. I'm one person, my mother would refer to me as they. Um, I kind of liked it when she got to child of mine. Um, Cause that's what she would say, child of mine. She wouldn't call me by my name. She would say child of mine. And so we went through that process before she could call me Raquel. I want, remember one time she called me, I was living here in Atlanta and she said, um, I'm doing my insurance paperwork for work or, you know, her job. Then I have to put, you know, you guys down or whatever. And she says, um, what's your name on your ID? And I kind of felt like, oh, who's trying? Girl, my name is Raquel. And I told my mother then, <laughs> um, and she says, um, I told my mother then, if you can't call me Raquel, then maybe we don't need to talk anymore. And I just did an interview maybe about a year ago. My mother did not, she didn't do well with hearing that. So much so that my mother says she doesn't remember. Well, yeah, she doesn't hit so much so that she doesn't remember. She she didn't she did not like hearing that I said to her, if you can't call me by my name, then we can't talk anymore. Um and my mother's response to me plainly was, Well, we're not gonna stop talking, so I didn't spell it. But my mother today, she doesn't remember. Yeah. So well, what does um or what did acceptance look like with your siblings? My, <laughs> my siblings would accept well. My baby sister and brother, now we can sign makeup, all they've ever known is their sister. So that wasn't a process. Um, my brother, um, Sharice and James, when I, when I completed transition, my brother James was incarcerated. My sister was not, and my sister was good with me as long as I didn't tell her no. If I didn't tell her no, that I was beautiful, I was a big sister, and she loved me, and so forth and so on. My brother, uh, I wrote him, he wrote wrote me, yes, he wrote me, and I wrote him back. And I told him, you have a big sister now, and either you can accept me or not, and if you can't accept me, then you know you can go on with your life. The letter that I got back from him, he said, I guess I better start this letter off by saying, hey, big sis, Raquel, you okay? And so that was um, what acceptance looked like. And and I found out most recently that telling him no uh, resor resorted in him calling me names and, you know, and letting me know, I guess I flew how you really feel. Yeah. Um, he told me, you're my brother, you're my son's uncle. Um, and my response was the same to him as it was to my sister. Just flip. I told my sister, I'm more woman than you'll ever be and more man than you'll ever have. 
So my brother, I'm more man than you'll ever be and more woman than you'll ever have. And that shut both of them the hell up. They were fucked up when I said it to the both of them. And I said it to the both of them at, on diff- at different times. But, I, but that's my that's my that's my belief. And I know that that I'm more woman than my will ever be. And she was born a woman. And I didn't choose that. I just made different decisions in my life than she did. So Does I, I can't help that. Huh? Does it hurt? Well, absolutely. Does it hurt? Of course. I'm I'm a human. So of course. I don't I can tell you this though, it doesn't hurt like it used to. Yeah. It used to hurt very bad. Um, like so much so that I would get in again just so I could have them a part of my life. Because as long as I was saying yes, they loved me. As long as I was saying yes, they showed me love. And Mm -hmm. so for a long time, I would, because they hurt me, I would give in again so that I could have my sibling. Um, now you know, uh, I so I don't speak to either. Either, um, however, now when they say no, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, what got you to that strong place? Huh? What got you to that strong place? Um, what got me here? I believe keep going through it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, like, you get stronger every time. Yeah, and keep saying it's okay, so they'll be in my life. That gave them the license to do it again. Yeah. And that said, I believe it said to them that it's okay that when she tells us no or she doesn't make the decision that we want in favor of us, that we, you know, call our faggot or say she's really our brother, that kind of thing. Um, she'll get over it and love us again. We'll just go through mommy, but she'll get over it and love us again. She'll pull us in again. She'll be there for us again. And at 47, I'm not doing that. Like, like I honestly, truly... <laughs> Honestly, truly, don't check out. Yeah, mm-hmm. I never be here to say that I don't care. I will always love them, but I don't care if they're a part of my life or not. Yeah, you got to move on at some point if they're not willing to love you as you are and accept you and love you through yes, no, maybe. Yeah, you kind of have to make some decisions for yourself at that point. It's not about anybody other than yourself and your mental health, frankly. Um, we could do this all day. Uh, we could do this all night, but we got to wrap it. Um, Raquel, we thank you so much for joining us. But if you could leave folk with anything, like any words of wisdom, encouragement, what, what would you say to people that are transitioning, that are trying to figure it out? What would you say? Say, so this is how I, this is how I'll frame it. I would say to my younger self. It's going to be okay. You're not a mistake. All right. God knew exactly who you were going to be before your mama and daddy got together. Come on. And when the dust settles, it will indeed be worth it all. So hold on. Hang in there. It does get greater later if you hold on. And the caveat is you got to hold on. That's awesome. Y'all need to write that down. So go back and play this again and write it down. Raquel Henry, we thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we thank you for sharing your story, um, educating, and most importantly, um, being a part of this space in this open space, which will always be safe. Um, we're going to start preparing to close out. But before we do that, Malik is going to go over some sponsorship um, for those of you that are considering um, sponsorship or looking for sponsorship. Malik is going to go through that really quick before we close out. Thanks, so, Malik. Yeah. I want to say thank you to the both of you, though, before you start. Thank, thank you, me. Malik. Thank you, Raquel. I appreciate you both. Oh, thank, thank you. you. We love you. Um, love you we can't wait to see you in uh, Transworld Atlanta season one. It's going to be right. crazy, y'all. It's going to be crazy, y'all. Yes, yes, yes. So, sponsorship, yes. It's a trans world podcast. So listen, we need sponsorship. Um, we will be getting together sponsorship packages. Um, what that looks like is we will put your business on our platform, but we need sponsorship. We need sponsorship to get this out to the masses. So you will be able to contact us through our um, Instagram page, Trans World Atlanta, or you can 
subscribe to our YouTube page um, to keep track of us. But we need sponsorship. Um, again, this is important work but we can't get it out to the masses doing it by ourselves. So again, you can contact um, Raquel through Dreamcatchers Production um, on Facebook. You can contact us through social media, Transwell Atlanta on our Instagram page. And please, please subscribe. Subscribe to our YouTube page. And we are definitely looking for sponsorship. Yep, you heard them. So guys, make sure you check out all of our social handles. Um, Dreamcatchers uh, Productions on Facebook, Transworld Atlanta on Instagram, and um, definitely get over to the YouTube page. We have lots of uh, reels on there highlighting the season. Uh, we'll be streaming on several platforms toward the end of the um, summer, so stay tuned. We keep all that stuff posted on our social media sites, but we hate to leave you, but we got to close out. It's always a good time at the cookout. And, you know, us black folk, we love a good cookout. So um, when we show up, we want you to know that this is a very open space. And until next time, we want to leave you with why we do this. It's a trans world podcast is to educate those about the trans experience and to highlight the importance of equality because we are all human. We want to explore the diverse experiences, challenges, and triumphs of the transgender community. And we love, we love, we love doing it with you. I'm your host, Raquel, leaving you with love. And until the next time, it's the Trans World Podcast. Remember, love is love.